All right, I just got the word that we are live. We are ready here. This is Greg Kaur from the Office of Special Education Programs, Monitoring and State Improvement Planning Division. And this afternoon, we're gonna to talk to you about um, Part C IDEA reporting, <clears throat> and then provide you with some monitoring updates. And I'm glad to be joined this afternoon by <clears throat> Angela Tanner-Dean and also Grace Kelly, is gonna be assisting us later on with facilitating some, some questions. So I wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> pardon my allergies here. Um, I wanna start first by thanking our friends at DAISY for inviting us to present. I've done this uh, quite a few years in the past and always look forward to this opportunity. Although we'd rather be talking to you face to face we're glad that we can join you in this virtual activity. You know, when we at the Department of Education received word on March 13th that we would be working from home full times, we um, expected this would be just kind of a temporary arrangement for a few weeks or maybe a month. Uh, little did we know that it would go on to, uh, to this extent. So here we are um, in the, I think it's the eighth month, who's counting at this point of working virtually, teleworking from home. Um, so we miss seeing you all and speaking to you in person, but value this need uh, for ongoing communication. In this afternoon's presentation, as I said, I'll be tag teaming with Angela Tanner-Dean. Angela is an Associate Division Director here in the Monitoring and State Improvement Planning Division of uh, OSEP, of MSIP. <clears throat> in addition to being a homeroom um, associate division director or team leader, where she has responsible for a dozen or so states, um, Angela is also the associate division director for the data implementation team. We have um, several um, implementation teams that are responsible for different processes within MSIP. The data implementation team is responsible for all things data-driven and principally, that's the state performance plan and annual performance report process. So Angela is spearheading this important work and is deeply involved, engaged in the SPP APR and has been for gosh, four or so years now. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention that um, this has been a particularly challenging year for all of us, but particularly for Angela. And let me give you just a few highlights. First of all, the SPP APR has moved from Grads 360, which we were all getting pretty comfortable with and accustomed to, to a new EMAPS reporting tool. Angela and her team spent countless hours working with the contractor and department staff to develop, refine, test, and work out all the kinks in the new platform so that it could be ready for states. <clears throat> uh, ready not as early as we had hoped, but ready um, in January. As both the Part C and Part D SPP APR information collection packages were expiring, Angela had an additional challenge. Um, she and her team had to go through an extensive months long process to consider changes to the SPP APR to develop the new packages, including the measurement tables and instructions, consult with leadership all the way up the chain, and then put the packages through the education and office of management and budget clearance process, which is very involved. <clears throat> As you probably know, it includes publication in the Federal Register for first a 60-day public and uh, comment period. And then <clears throat> when that uh, elapses, reviewing all the comments and responding to each of those, making any necessary changes based on the comments, and then putting it back out again for a 30-day comment period. So this is a months long, very extensive uh, process. And we knew that because the packages were expiring in August, 
we were working under a very tight timeline, but Angela and her team were able to carry this process out and get our new packages uh, approved in time. So those are a couple challenges, but there's more. Wait, there's more. Um, in the middle of all, of all this, COVID-19 sent us all home indefinitely. And we had to learn how to carry on our important processes um, virtually from our home offices. And then there were what you know, we call the routine processes, processes, which are challenging in and of themselves. This includes um, opening the system, um, the clarification process, finalizing the OSEP responses, and then making the final determinations under section 616 of the statute. So I certainly want to recognize Angela by way of introduction here for um, her heroic efforts during this very challenging year. Um, also want to mention Jennifer Wolfsheimer, who is the facilitator for the data IT, Christine Pilgrim, um, who is a kind of a co-conspirator um, another ADD who works closely with the data IT and actually had been the facilitator for a number of previous years. And then Diana Yu um, from my office who has um, provided whatever assistance is available um, in utilizing her many talents to help the data IT. So it's been quite a year. Um, this afternoon, Angela will share with you highlights and important information about both the 2019 package, so that's as we're in the final year of the current package, which has expired. So the 2019 package and the um, submissions for that are due on February 1st, 2021, right? That's the right year, we're in 2020 now. Um, and then she's also gonna talk to you about the new uh, package and submissions that were just approved by OMB. And those will be due on February 1st, 2022, which seems like it's way out in the future somewhere, but it's actually right around the corner. The second part of today's session will focus on OSEP's revised monitoring process. That's the differentiated monitoring and support process. Our revised version, we are cleverly referring to as DMS 2.0. Um, I'm supposed to be telling you to advance slides, so I think we can go to uh, slide two. Um, and actually, you could go on to slide three. Here we go. This is, this is a much more interesting, colorful slide. Um, so I want to provide you with a, a few updates before Angela gets into the, the meat of our content here. COVID-19 has significantly altered the landscape for all of us. Um, as EI programs and schools suspended their services or struggled to go to virtual platforms, the department was inundated with questions from providers, um, administrators, and parents about the impact of COVID-19 on the continued delivery of services. <clears throat> so I was, um, Proud to be part of a kind of a SWAT team in MSIP that reviewed those questions as they came in and began developing responses and submitting them through the clearance process, um, which um, was a rigorous process, I might add. But we were successful in getting a number of question and answer documents posted on our IDEA website. So I hope you've had a chance to see those. But if you haven't, I just want to kind of highlight some of the ones that may be of particular interest to you. We have one um, IDEA Part C evaluation and assessment timelines during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, Part C procedural safeguards, again in the COVID-19 environment. IDEA Part C use of funds, uh, describing any flexibility with the use of funds during COVID-19. Um, and then IDEA Part C dispute resolution during COVID-19. Um, I also wanted to point out that under the 
the CARES Act, there was a provision for SEAs to request a waiver of their 2018 funds, which normally would have expired at the end of September for obligation at the end of December for liquidation. Um, we know that there are a number of um, Part C programs that are located within the SEAs of their state. So we were able to get approval to make this uh, waiver process available to those Part C programs that were under an SEA. So at this point, I believe there were six um, Part C programs which requested and ultimately received permission to use those funds for an extra year. So the 2018 funds, instead of expiring um, in September, in this past September, they can use them for uh, another uh, 12 months until September 2021. So those are just some of the resources that we've provided um, under COVID-19. <clears throat> I know in advance, um, Daisy solicited questions and there were several questions about equity and our commitment to equity. And I just wanted to say, as we carry out our work, we want to emphasize our continued commitment to equity within our organization and our program. In the development and management of our programs, and when providing external leadership to improve outcomes uh, for infants, toddlers, youth, and children and youth with disabilities and their families, we see equity as an essential component of our program. <clears throat> we have to recognize that first and foremost, IDEA is all about equity for uh, children with disabilities. Both ECTA and NCSI have created hubs for the COVID-19 resources. OSEP recognized, recognizes that the hubs for COVID-19 are looking at equity in relation to technical assistance. Encourage all of you to look at these websites um, and reach out to them for resources and support that may be useful to you. The issue of equity in relation to IDEA services has not changed for OSEP. In fact, under COVID-19, there's a reaffirmation of the central tenets of IDEA. And that reaffirmation is found in the guidance documents from OSEP, the use of evidence-based practices, and the webinars provided this summer on providing services during the pandemic. So those are just a, a few of my updates. Hope I didn't take up too much time here. And I want to turn our presentation over to Angela Tanner-Dean. Angela? Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, thank you for that amazing introduction <laughs> um, to just give some highlights of the work that the data team has been doing over the course um, of the past six to eight months. And I'm happy to be able to be here um, presenting at the IDIO conference to um, share with you some additional information um, and to go through um, what is upcoming in the world of data IT um, for MSIP. I think we're ready for our next slide, right? Next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, so actually, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So if there's anyone in the audience today that was also able to join us last Thursday for OSEP's national TA call, uh, most of this information will sound familiar, but um, it's important information and not to mention so incredibly fascinating and interesting. We <laughs> thought we would um, <laughs> repeat it for you again. Um, so I'd like to start by uh, covering some of the details about the FFY 2019 SPP APR, uh, which is due February 1st, 2021. I'll discuss the SPP APR package, the reporting platform, and talk a little bit about 2021 annual determinations. Next slide, please. The SPP APR package has been released. Um, you can find it at the link that is provided on this slide. Um, it includes the measurement table, 
uh, which states will be using to report um, in February 2021. It includes uh, the SPP APR memo and instructions, which provide additional information and guidance about the upcoming submission. Um, and there's just a screenshot on this slide of the three documents. So the memo, um, the measurement table, and the instructions. And again, you can find those documents on the link that is provided. Next slide, please. Last week, uh, the Partner Support Center sent out the FFY 2019 SPP APR template, which is also known as the collection tool to assist states with pulling together the information for the SPP APR. The template mirrors the FFY 2019 measurement table. So generally states like to go ahead and start to populate the collection tool in advance of the system opening. OSEP is also working on a separate streamlined template for reporting on indicator C11, which is the ESIP. This template is not included in the collection tool that was released last week. Um, we will actually be releasing it um, in the coming weeks. And it's really designed to um, reduce burden, state burden, um, and focuses specifically on um, the requirements consistent with the measurement table and the work that states implemented during FFY 2019. This template is not required, but we are strongly encouraging states um, to utilize it. It will be in a 508 compliant format. Um, so you would be able to drop your information right into that template um, and submit it, upload it um, into the system April 1st. Uh, we mentioned in last week's TA call, and I will mention again today, that the APR, uh, SPP APR reporting platform will not open until late December. Um, there are several things that impacted this timeline. We had hoped that we would be able to open it earlier this year because it is the second year um, that we will be using this particular tool, but the rollover activities from um, this last submission, which included uh, doing a lot of conversion of documents to uh, ensure that they were 508 compliant, as well as some of the shifts in the 618 data reporting timelines um, impacted how quickly the contractor has been able to focus on the rollover activities. So we're looking at a uh, mid to late December um, opening date for the system. As it relates to 508 compliance, we've talked about uh, this quite a bit over the past year. Uh, OSEP is strongly encouraging states to report as much of uh, the data and information that is required in your submission within the reporting tool to, and minimize the number of attachments that are submitted. We definitely recognize that the APR is not just a document for OSEP. It's a document and a report that states often use for their stakeholders and for um, you know, legislat legislators and other stakeholders. Um, and so they have the opportunity in the past to attach supplemental information and, and other documents that uh, complete the state story and provide additional context. But unfortunately, the limitations of this tool um, and some of the requirements that we have to be compliant with security um, requirements prevent us from really be, being able to take a lot of attachments. Okay, next slide, please. We have received a lot of questions about how OSEP will handle 2021 determinations in light of the potential data concerns. 
Um, because there is so much variability in terms of the impact of COVID-19 across the states, we're unable to make any decisions or share any final information at this time regarding whether or not OSEP will be changing the process for determinations. Uh, we want to wait until after February 1st when we have the opportunity to see what information and what data states are able to report um, before making some of those final decisions. But we do want to remind um, states that OSEP has always had the ability to consider other publicly available information when we are making decisions about determinations. Um, there is precedent for this on a much smaller scale, of course. Um, in uh, previous years when states have been impacted by hurricanes or other natural disasters, we have considered that information in um, making decisions around those state-specific determinations. So this will be on a little bit larger scale, obviously, because it affects the entire country. Um, but we have that ability and we'll be uh, utilizing that flexibility as we move forward. Next slide, please. I was very excited to be able to find an appropriate cartoon <laughs> to, <laughs> to lighten the mood a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I struggle to uh, find things that are um, lighthearted about data. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, this cartoon says, should we always ignore what the data says or just is this just more of a one time thing? <laughs> um, and this definitely is uh, a, a once in a lifetime uh, thing that we're dealing with uh, as it relates to COVID. Um, and one of the questions that we have been getting um, pretty much since the beginning, since March, is whether or not, um, or how, actually how OSEP will address the data issues um, that um, states experience as a result of COVID-19. And I wish we could just ignore the data <laughs> um, and what the data says this year, because uh, obviously it will not uh, accurate, accurately reflect what is happening um, in states and, and actual performance and, and will probably be uh, unlike any uh, data we've seen before. But in order to uh, address that, if you would go to the next slide, we have added some additional instruction in the SPP APR package instructions that just went out. Um, we definitely recognize that there will be states that have incomplete data, low data, and perhaps even no data for certain indicators um, due to COVID-19. So in the upcoming submission um, for 2021, OSEP is expecting states to just report whatever you have under each indicator. Um, if there are specific issues related to the data collection or your ability to report data, um, like data completeness issues, data quality issues uh, that are a result of COVID-19, we are asking states to describe those specific issues as well as any action taken to address those issues in the narrative portion of your submission under each indicator. Um, additionally, if there is slippage in your data um, or drops in the level of compliance, you should also explain um, that in the additional information um, and narrative section of each affected indicator. As it relates to reporting on correction of non-compliance, which could also be an area that's impacted by COVID, if the state was unable to verify correction consistent with 0902 due to the impact of COVID, that information should be captured in the narrative. And um, I've already talked about the last talking point I have here. I've already covered in terms of um, how we will utilize this information, both the um, uh, 
quantitative numerical data as well as the information you provide in your narrative when we make decisions about how OSEP will utilize that data and um, make decisions regarding that data. Next slide, please. Uh, next, I want to move into the FFY 2020 SPP APR, um, talk a little bit about some of the key changes, um, the guidance that we will be developing um, around the reporting requirements for the submission that's due February 1st, 2022. So we've gotten several emails um, that folks may be having some difficulty accessing the response to comments on regulations.gov, um, which would have, um, should have accompanied the publishing of the cleared um, information collection. We have found out that the site, the regulations.gov website is being updated information's being merged. Apparently there's some kind of beta site that is like only available Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's a message on regulations.gov that you can um, kind of read um, and find out more about what's happening. But I have the most current links that were live and working as of this morning. So I'll put those in the chat. Um, when I'm done talking and, and Greg's going um, over some of the DMS work, I'll put those links in the chat so folks can have um, access um, to that information. And that's where you will be able to find more detailed information about our thinking and our rationale um, as it relates to the changes in the new measurement table. All right, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with a uh, change that affects the entire SPP APR, specifically the change uh, related to stakeholder engagement reporting requirements. States have always been required to include information about how stakeholders were involved in setting targets. However, with the new information collection, states are also required to provide additional information, which includes the number of parent members and a description of how the parent members in the state advisory panel, um, parent center staff, parents from local statewide advocacy and advisory committees, um, and individual parents were engaged in target setting, analyzing data, and developing improvement strategies. So it's a little bit more um, detailed and comprehensive than just generally how stakeholders were um, involved in target setting. We are also requiring that states uh, provide a description of the activities conducted to increase the capacity of diverse groups of parents to support the development and implementation activities designed to improve outcomes for children with disabilities, as well as the mechanism and timelines for soliciting public input for target setting, analyzing data, and developing improvement um, strategies and the mechanisms and timelines for making uh, the results of that analysis um, available to the public. So again, it's a, a, similar, um, a similar requirement that we have had previously, but much more explicit and detailed in what we are asking states to report. Next slide, please. For indicator C4, there are changes to the measurement as it relates to response rate and representativeness. Um, those changes are captured on the slide. Um, in the FFY 20 submission that's due February 1st, 2022, states will have to compare the results response rate to the previous year and describe strategies to increase the response rate, analyze the response rate to identify potential non-response bias, and take steps to reduce bias and pr promote increased response, um, as well as describing the metric um, used to, to um, determine representativeness. 
Um, so this, again, is, is similar information that's been uh, required in the past, but much more detailed um, so that OSEP has a more complete picture about what states are doing in the area of response rate and representativeness. Additionally, in order to report high quality data, we believe that states must consider race ethnicity when analyzing the extent to which the demographics of families responding are representative. So starting with the FFY 2021 APR, so that would be due in February 1st, 2023, states must also include race ethnicity in the analysis of representativeness. So that was a lot of words, but it's <laughs> um, right there on your slide, um, captured in the new measurement table as well. And uh, these changes really were an attempt to um, make the data more robust and higher quality. Next slide, please. The changes for indicators four and five are um, just related to states no longer being required to compare their data to national data. And then next slide um, is indicator um, 11, the ESSIP, um, and this is specific to um, the 2022 submission. Um, the 2022 submission will align with the submission date for all of the other indicators. So the ESSIP will be due on February 1st. Um, the ESSIP will be uh, able to be reported um, in the same manner as the other indicators. So through the reporting platform. Um, and this is consistent with um, OSEP's uh, goal of not having a significant amount of attachments um, and really uh, encouraging states to, to put all data within the reporting tool. So with that, I'm going to send it back over to Greg. I will put those links in the chat for folks and um, we'll be taking questions at the end. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I believe that the chat is now open for questions. So if you have anything um, to ask about the material that Angela has presented, please begin entering that now, but still, I want you to pay attention to me. Don't get me wrong, but uh, if you have any overarching questions about the SPP APR, please, uh, please add those. Could you please advance the slide? Um, so this next part of our presentation is going to be about differentiated monitoring and support. As a part of OSEP OSER's Rethink Initiative, we looked at the three big processes that, uh, that MSIP is involved in. <clears throat> One is, should there be changes to the SPP APR process? And um, <clears throat> as Angela has described, we have made some, um, some tweaks, some changes to the SPP APR that will be coming due in 20. 22 and that are reflected in the new package that just became available. The second area that we looked at was the determination process. We got um, a lot of input on that. Um, we don't anticipate that there will be major changes in 2021, but may look forward to more significant changes um, in 2022, which will be the first year that the new package is reported on. Um, and then third, which brings us to uh, my discussion here, is changes to the differentiated monitoring and support process. We held, um, I believe it was a total of 18 input sessions, some of them live, most of them through conference calls with various stakeholders to solicit uh, input regarding changes to any of our three processes, including differentiated monitoring and support. We uh, listened to the input that you provided. Um, 
and also did a lot of self-reflection and analysis, um, asking ourselves the question, does our monitoring process, is it an effective vehicle for monitoring states and providing support to improve services for children with disabilities at the same time ensuring compliance? A little background, um, DMS 1.0, we didn't call it that because there wasn't a 2.0, but DMS uh, began uh, midway through 2016. So we had what we're calling a truncated period uh, uh, in the spring of 2016, and then we um, used it for all states later on in the fall of 2016. It was a risk-based process consistent with the uh, uniform guidance. The uniform guidance, among other things, says that um, federal programs like ours should assess risk to the program, risk to the department, um, uh, as it determines priorities for monitoring. So taking that to heart, the way we translated that was looking at risk across four essential areas. And you may remember, uh, if you were in a state agency at that time, those areas were physical risk, compliance, results, and state systemic improvement plan. And under each one of those, we had um, a number of data points and factors. Uh, we actually used a uh, computerized program that was developed for us to kind of you know, crunch all the numbers and come up with some some uh, risk numbers across each of these four areas. And then based on that risk, we would determine what we were, determine what we were calling level of engagement. If you had high risk of failure in a particular area, um, you would get intensive intervention, moderate risk, um, um, what did we call it? Moderate, moderate risk would get, um, moderate form of intervention and then low risk. Target, targeted. Nothing, that's the word was this, <laughs> target. And, and universal, we, yeah. And then universal for, for everybody else. Um, so we used this, this system for um, a couple of years and um, there were some lessons learned, some takeaways uh, based on our analysis and the input that we got from you, the stakeholders. And all the system, although the system had its benefits, there were some, some points that we felt could be strengthened. One is that by looking across these four areas and determining our level of engagement based solely on these risk factors, um, we ended up having what we decided was too narrow of an approach. Um, you know, we might be only looking at results or only looking at physical, but never were able to do a comprehensive analysis of the state's general supervision, supervisory program. Um, so that was, that was an issue. We, we had felt like in previous um, monitoring systems that emphasis on general supervision was extremely important, both to our understanding uh, of the state's process, but also of the state understanding how various components of his program work together. So too narrow an approach. And then the other problem is that because we use risk to select the states that we would monitor, we tended to see many of the same state programs kind of rising to the intensive level each year. <clears throat> and um, we didn't want to have a monitoring program that ultimately resulted in us just going to, that was back when we got to travel, um, but just going to a few states or a handful of the same states because the flip side of that coin is that there were a number of states that we hadn't gone to, um, I don't know why my phone is ringing, excuse me here, that we hadn't gone to um, for quite a while. Um, and we believe that there is benefit in having OSEP on site and engaging um, in a comprehensive way with states, um, um, regardless of what their risk factors might be. We felt like our system didn't really uh, allow us to do that. <clears throat> Hence, 
we moved to DMS 2.0, taking all these considerations into, um, uh, into consideration, we developed a new process. Um, if we could move to the next slide. <clears throat> so we decided, first of all, instead of taking this um, approach, kind of almost more of a siloed approach by looking at different risk areas, we decided to go back to looking at um, states programs in a comprehensive way using general supervision as the kind of overarching umbrella concept. So what you see here are the, um, the famous puzzle pieces that were developed, I can't say how many years ago, maybe 15, 10 or 15. If you've been with the program that long, you may recognize them. But um, you know, we tried um, a number of years ago to articulate what we thought the discrete um, components were of an effective general supervision system. So we um, saw a lot of merit in that and um, made some decisions to go back to looking at general supervision and each of the components in there. Um, so you'll see we've got eight big systems. <clears throat> They're discrete, but at the same time, each of them connects. Um, they are not, they are not uh, freestanding autonomous systems, but they actually inform each other um, to support the state's general supervision of its program. So we have the data systems, the way states collect data about their, their local programs manipulation of the data, the aggregation of the data to look at uh, statewide trends. The state performance plan, annual performance report, which is very much related to data for reasons I don't even need to really go into, but it's composed largely of the state's data across those indicators. Improvement efforts, um, you know, again, a data-driven process, but we would expect that states would analyze their data to determine <clears throat> where um, you know, improvement is most needed. Dispute resolution is a key component of IDEA, whether it be informal dispute resolution mechanisms like, um, like mediation and uh, resolution sessions or more formal, such as filing a state complaint or requesting a due process hearing. But we saw this as a key um, area not only for parents to resolve issues regarding their child's program, um, but also reviewing the data from the dispute resolution systems so that the state can begin to identify trends um, if there are particular areas that keep kicking out. <clears throat> it may call for um, a more intensive look by the state. Implementation of policies and procedures. We know that local programs um, have policies and procedures. Uh, most of them kind of sign off on them, but do they really implement them in the way that they are intended? So uh, both the development of, of policies and procedures, uh, getting those out to your local programs, but also determining the extent to which they are implemented is a key part of a general supervision system. <clears throat> Physical management, um, it's money that keeps the programs going. Um, the IDEA funds are used for very specific purposes uh, for the Part C program, and it's the state's obligation to make sure that funds are properly used by their, by their local programs. <clears throat> TA and professional development, um, state should be using the data it collects to determine where the greatest TA needs are. Um, also where capacity building is necessary for uh, both state and local staff to carry out effective programs. And this isn't a, you know, a one-stop deal. It's a kind of an ongoing need um, that states need to carry out uh, annually, if not more often. <clears throat> and then the last one um, is integrated monitoring activities. What are the various components of a state's monitoring process that do the two things that are specified 
by IDEA, which is um, improving performance, improving outcomes for kids with disabilities and their family, and at the same time, ensuring that um, there's programmatic compliance across uh, all the IDEA requirements. So we've gone back to this concept and we will be looking through our um, protocols that we're developing at each one of these processes, roughly one every month or two. <clears throat> and um, there are some more uh, features of the new program that I wanted to spend a moment talking to you. If we could go to the next slide. We recognize that um, the single year process for selecting the state, re, 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 conducting a monitoring review, and, and then working with the state to um, develop corrective actions um, was not really supporting either states or us in engaging with states in a meaningful way. Um, and also, as I talked about before, this, the state selection process didn't involve getting to every state over a designated period of time. So we've made a couple changes. One is uh, in our DMS 2.0 um, framework, we will be going to every state and entity in a, over a five year period. <clears throat> so we're breaking the states up into cohorts one, two, three, four, and five. We'll show you um, the, the first cohort in a subsequent slide here, but everybody will get a visit. We hope that those visits are in person, but if they're not in person, they will be virtual um, over this five year period. Also, um, when a state is selected to be part of a cohort, they will be going through a three year process. Um, and here we've kind of outlined the process. Year one, which just began on October 1st for the cohort one states is pre-site work and preparation. During that time, we'll, we will be providing um, a lot of universal TA available to all states, not just the year one states, but to all states. Um, and the TA will focus on each of the components of a general supervisory system. Um, so we'll be, dis we'll be discussing the protocols with states during that first year. Um, the second year then um, will follow and we'll actually be doing some monitoring based on our pre-site work. Um, we are uh, thinking that we will be differentiating. We will identify the areas where we need to engage more intensively with the state after doing a kind of more comprehensive review. So year two, we'll be engaging with the state. At the end of year two, we will be sending the state a monitoring report, which describes features of their program, areas where the state is doing well. Um, also, it will identify any findings of non-compliance. We know that um, effective corrective action uh, often is not a one or two month process, but can take a year and sometimes more when there are more systemic deficiencies. So in this third year then, um, we will be engaging with states around um, tech, providing technical assistance um, and examining their corrective action. So we can work kind of hand in glove with states through the correction process. So this buys us time uh, and the state time to do this in a really thoughtful way um, that will improve their system. So those are the three years. So we picture the three years and then we have five cohorts. So um, this year we're in year one for cohort one. Um, next year we will begin year one for cohort two, but move to year two for cohort one. I think you can see how it's kind of a, a building process, which will require a lot of very careful tracking on our, on our part. Um, one thing that has gotten brought up um, is, well, what about a, an issue that is significant but unanticipated that comes up 
uh, for a state that is not scheduled for um, a monitoring visit anytime soon. Um, so we have reserved some capacity for emerging issues um, so we can uh, be nimble and pivot and um, engage with states around more uh, systemic but serious problems, um, even though the state's um, monitoring cycle may not have it being monitored for for several years out. So generally states won't be monitored uh, except as a part of their particular cohort, but there will be exceptional cases where we may need to engage uh, with a state off cycle. Next slide, please. Hey, Greg, I, I just wanted to give you the 10 minute warning. Yeah, I was about to say, I can see we're running. <laughs> so I think I've gotten through the, the meat of what I wanted to convey here. Uh, this last slide um, just shows that um, we will be providing universal TA for all states on a monthly basis. Also targeted, there's that word I couldn't remember, targeted interviews um, with states and also providing um, or, or requesting documents for states. We know that most states have their key documents posted online, so we don't anticipate that this will be a heavy lift, but there may be specific documents um, that we want as evidence of a state implementing a system. So all these things will um, occur during the first year of DMS. Next slide, please. And drum roll, these are the states that um, we have selected for year one. Um, I'll let you examine this yourself. I won't read it off to you, but these are the states. And for, I didn't mention that for every state, with a couple exceptions here, um, we will be, for instance, Arkansas. When we, when we go to work with Arkansas, we'll be looking at both their Part C and their Part B programs during the same year. Um, we've got a couple that are split out for, because the, like for uh, Alaska B, the C program was monitored not so long ago, but we need to do B. Um, but generally, this is the way the, the cohorts will uh, roll out. So we'll be going to, you know, Colorado B and C, uh, engaging with them during the same three-year period as part of the same cohort. Next slide, please. Okay, we're quickly here. Um, are some links where you can get more information. Our monitoring protocols, um, which are in development, uh, will be uh, rolled out at this site, um, sites at ed.gov, IDEA. Um, the recordings for the national TA calls, if you're not able to listen to those live, will be uh, housed here at the OSEP Ideas That Work site. And, um, relevant TA center resources will be at the ECTA center site and then for part B at the NCIS site and both ECTA and NCIS are serving as hubs for TA um, documents and resources. So we thank them for that. Next slide. Okay, this is what we wanted to get to. So we're gonna ask Grace in the uh, remaining six minutes here to yeah. uh, any questions that we have. Hi, Grace. How are you? Good. How are you guys? Um, so, well. I'll, yeah, I'll try to um, summarize some of the questions because we had some comments that people can see the questions. And thank you to Angela for quickly answering them if we don't get to all of them. So one of the first questions was um, not being able to put graphs, charts, or other graphics in the um, APR. And the answer to that is that OSEP understands that, but due to, um, due to um, security concerns, that may not be addressed. Another question, uh, and then there's a request for, is there some ways that OSEP or the TA centers could provide some al alternative ways to display your data? And the answer is yes, we will work on that. Um, another question that came out is, uh, I may have, from Anne, I'm jumping back and forth, will changes to the SPP requirements be implemented based on the changes to the reporting requirements to help guide states on setting targets appropriately? Um, Angela answered, and I don't know if you want to add, that um, 
First, the FFY 2019 ESSIP template, followed shortly by the TA and guidance related to FFY 2020 reporting requirements, including stakeholder engagement, target setting, representativeness, and sampling plans will be available. Look for the 2020 guidance late early November, early December. And Angela, do you want to add? If I, if I understood, hopefully I understood the question correctly, um, that the question was about um, any guidance that would be provided around target setting for the new um, package. And so I tried to address that um, with kind of a preview of what we're thinking in terms of when guide will be um, pushing out additional guidance. Another person asked if the IDEA extension uh, applies um, to Part C programs that are led by an, a lead agency other than ED. And Angela answered that this does not currently apply to Part C programs that are not ED leads. Um, the fiscal team has been referring Part C program to the CARES Act guidance. Angela? Yeah, we really ex tried to, we explored that thoroughly, but um, the way the CARES Act was written, it was um, very clear that it referred only to state education agencies and that we could not um, apply that or extend that to uh, other state age, Part C state agencies other than an SEA. So the compromise was for those agencies that did have ed leads, we were able to extend the, uh, the uh, period of availability. And a couple of people asked for links um, to the new package and Angela provided those as well. Those are the- Yeah, I think, oh, I think that the links I gave are directly to the um, response to comments. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I can maybe click on one of them in the next two minutes and see. <laughs> I was going to try to pull it up, but I couldn't get it to come up. Um, so a couple of people have um, mentioned supporting the first states who are going through cohort one and looking forward to learning from them. Also some comments thanking you guys for taking this time to share with them. Um, nice. Other, I don't see other questions right now, but you can certainly add them. And I think Angela also said that if you can um, plug those into the chat, we will save those and they're willing to answer those questions in written if you're not able to answer, ask questions now. And I, I just clicked on the link and all of the documents are there. So it's all of the, the measurement table, the memo, instructions, the response to comments, everything um, is at that the link, so you should be good to go. And then I also wanted to um, mention one additional thing in terms of the resources that are on the last slide that Greg um, reviewed and uh, he talked about as we uh, release protocols throughout this phase one, they'll be available um, at that link. Uh, the, the fiscal protocols actually are already there and available to states, um, so you can, um, get a, a look at those fiscal protocols um, that actually have been, um, we've been utilizing those for, for a couple of years. I think there might have been some slight tweaks in preparation for phase one, but uh, those can be found at that, uh, at that link. Thank you. TA, TA centers are collaborating as well to get resources. Um, but somebody asked, will the slides be posted on the uh, DAISY website? Yes, they will, after the conference. Other questions or comments? I think we're at time. So, Greg or Angela, do you have anything you want to talk with or? Well, I will, I will be happy to take us out here. Thank you, Grace, for doing such a great job of combining those questions. And thank you, Angela, for answering most of them in the chat. So that made, that made yeah. my job easy. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for participating today. If you do have other questions that, uh, that, that occur to you later, please email me or Angela, um, greg.cordad.gov or 
angela.tanner-dean at ed.gov. We will be happy to try to respond to you. So thanks and everyone. I, thanks I, for having us. And yes. I want to thank you both for um, the 117 people who attended. Um, <laughs> and if I was able to, we would do the standing ovation <laughs> where you heard on the beginning. So um, standing ovation clapping and thank you for this so looking forward to seeing everybody at the thank rest you so much all right thank you bye. grace bye bye